Picture this. 2017. Orange man just got elected. We're going to build a wall. GT Online was about to get flying bikes, changing the game forever. PewDiePie was about to be involved in a bridge incident. What a f Jeez, oh my god. What Battle Royals and Battle Passes were to become the next big thing in the gaming industry. That was one hell of a year. 2017 was also the year Rainbow Six Siege truly skyrocketed in popularity. Before that, me and a few of my friends kept grinding CSGO, almost daily. We were so invested we kept watching every CSGO major we had the opportunity to. For us, it culminated early that year, when Virtus Pro, our Polish pride, reached the grand final of the E-League Atlanta major. We ended up getting hearts broken after losing a very close match to Astralis in what was probably the single greatest major final to this day. 16-14 against Virtus Pro! Unbelievable! However, shortly after that, some of us, mostly me, began to experience burnout and started to play less and less. I have started to look for an alternative. I heard about Siege before, but never got a chance to try it due to my outdated hardware. This changed partway into 2017, and I decided to check Siege out shortly before Operation Health began. After getting the starter edition, which most would consider a terrible mistake, I felt the magic again. It had a very similar competitive drive compared to CS, while offering a different take gunplay that suited me far more and a different take on, on paper. Very similar game modes due to the inclusion of the prep phase. Later on, some of my friends joined me on this siege adventure and we had fun. Eventually, we've got new operators, including Ella, with whom I still have the most playtime. Not necessarily because she's Polish or from Grom or she has green hair. And while we were getting tired of some BS that sometimes happened, Ella was definitely busting the release, so was Lion. We still had fun until mid 2018, when the cracks began to appear. Before we begin, I want to say that Parabellum is one of the best seasons Rainbow Six has ever had. Hell, it may be THE best season. We've got two defenders, one good and one top tier in Alibi and Mice respectively. Both of them brought good guns. The first LMG on defense, a Volta shotgun, a shotgun revolver hybrid and a good SMG and revolver. Not to mention, Villa is a decent map and a new defender gadget was introduced. The bulletproof camera, which wasn't that good but it was something new to play with. However, something during the season, Ubisoft announced they would try to combat a city that, back then, was on the rise. Trying to make the game a better place for everyone is a good thing, and Ubisoft's dedication to that front should be commended. The fact that, apparently, they keep failing at that is an entirely different matter. However, the initial approach was beyond appalling. Instead of manual report system, Ubisoft decided they would use an AI not only to detect bad language, but also ban any offender on the spot. This was bad. The AI completely ignored the context of words written in the text chat. Typos, speaking not in English, getting baited, even some memes could get you banned. Thankfully, the decision was reverted, but it was the first red flag we've been given. The next one came with Operation Grim Sky, although we didn't notice it back then. That season we didn't get a new map, instead we've been given a rework of Hereford Base, made to be more competitively viable. Old Hereford had its flaws, but it was fun and unique. Meanwhile, New Hereford is, as far as I know, still hated. People didn't like it at the point that during one of the seasonal events, Old Hereford was brought back for a moment instead of the new one. Thankfully, we've been given brand new maps for the next two seasons, even if they weren't liked that much. But that was about to change. How many of you were there? I killed five of you? I think? Year 4 was a turning point in Siege's development. Not the first season though. Burnt Horizon brought us two Australian operators, new guns for us to play with and a new map. Like I said before, the map that came with the season wasn't like it that much, but Gridlock and Mozzie were overall a good addition to the game. 
Every season after that, however, was completely different. Phantom Sight changed a lot. Like during Green Sky, instead of getting a new map, we've got a rework, this time of Cafe Dostoevsky. The rework wasn't as extensive though. I want to believe Ubisoft has learned its lesson from her for rework, and instead of completely overhunting the entire map, they only decided to improve it. Also, instead of getting two operators from one unit, we've got two different units, again similar to Grim Sky. This time, though, we did not receive any new weapons for us to use. To be fair, reusing weapons was inevitable, with how many guns were there already in the game, and getting licenses for new ones isn't probably cheap. However, this came out of blue, and no one was prepared for that. Ever since Phantom Sight, we've only got four new weapons, or one per year. To make matters even worse, one of the new operators, Warden, was one of the weakest operators we've ever gotten. In general, Phantom Sight felt stale. Cafe rework didn't feel unique enough to warrant no new map for this season, and the operators didn't bring enough to the table. Next season, Ember Rice was pretty much the same. This time, Canals were reworked, and we've got Goyo and Maru. The latter is notable as she was the first operator not to be a part of a counter-terrorist, police or similar unit. You could say Lion and Finca from Operation Camera were similar. However, they shared enough with GIGN and Spetsnaz respectively, and they even had interactions with other operators of said units in their bios. Amaru, meanwhile, was recruited to Rainbow Six. Why? Why would they need a combat, perimeter or even, archaeologist? Shifting Tides brought us Nighthaven, a private military company, which marked a shift in Siege's development to be more narrative-focused, at least I perceive it as such. Since that season, we've got four more Nighthaven operators, all of whom, excluding Ace, making more or less significant impact on the story. Eventually, the company itself turned into quasi-antagonists of Rainbow Six Siege. I don't know about you, but I feel White Masks would make for better antagonists. Remember them? For the season itself, this time we've got a new gun, a sniper rifle for Kali. However, it was rather underwhelming due to the nature of the game and how it focuses on close quarters combat. Kali herself remains one of the lesser attackers. Wamai was far more viable, although some liking when compared to Jaeger. Uh, four eliminated. Got him! Successful. Ah! That was nice. Eventually, we got the info in year 5, with a big bombshell dropped during the announcement. Starting from the third season, we'd be getting only one operator per season. Instead, we were promised operator reworks, with the Chanka being first on the line. And, to Yubi's credit, the rework made him at least a viable option who could bring something unique to the table with his LMG no longer mounted but still loaded and a new grenade launcher. Unfortunately, this was the only rework of this caliber. Other operators also received changes, but not as significant. The first two seasons of Year 5 were really similar to what we've got with past few seasons. I want to briefly stop to talk about Yana though. Like Amaru, she is not part of any combat unit, instead she is part of REU, an organization focused on space development. She is fun to play and has a unique gadget, but I can't imagine why she should be recruited to Rainbow Six. Speaking of gadgets, there were complaints that they were getting a bit too futuristic, even back during the end portion of Year 2. Personally, up until Void Edge, I found this to be somewhat exaggerated, even if Vigil was pushing it a little. Yana, however, changed that. Switch starts to take a few too many steps towards science fiction. To be clear, I wouldn't mind it as such if Siege started like that. But the game started relatively grounded in reality. At release, arguably the most futuristic gadget we had was Pulse's heartbeat sensor. Still, it's miles away from holograms made by drones, hives full of trucking nanobots, and mechanical limbs. We'll get to it. Shadow Legacy gave us Zero, aka Sam Fisher, one of the first crossovers we had in Siege. Thankfully, this one felt relatively possible, and Zero was overall a decent addition to the game. We also got aforementioned the Chanka rework, sight and scope adjustments, and a few more changes. Shadow Legacy was arguably the only good one operator season we had, at least up until recently. Finally, the last season of the 5th year brought Aruni, a Nighthaven member with mechanical limbs. Just as Yana, she kinda fell out of place in a ground game, maybe not so grounded anymore. 
Furthermore, she didn't feel that unique, as you could sum her up as castle but better. Honestly, you could say the same about pretty much any of your six operators. 15 seconds left. Near diffuser. Five seconds left. All friendlies have been eliminated. That was left. That was my left. That was my left. During year six, the narrative aspect became much more prevalent. The year started with Crimson Heist giving us Flores who not only was not a part of any CTU, but he was also a... robber? It's payday, fellas! Yeah, his bio states that he wants a stable life and he was brought to spy on Night Heaven, but... Come on, he still feels out of place. He belongs to payday. Ah, I need a medic bag! Thunderbirds from next season also didn't feel like a Rainbow Six operator, but not to the same extent, I have to admit. Uh, by the way, I think it's time to talk about skins. During the first year of Siege, Ubisoft started making elite sets for some operators. For the most part, this seemed like a more vintage uniforms, like Sledge's L Detachment or the Thatcher's Operation Nimrod. Over time though, this started to stray away from practicality or authenticity to... to the exact opposite. Montaigne's Mark II or IQ's reunification come to my mind. But... Uh, it gets worse. Year 6 brought more crossovers with other media. I haven't mentioned it yet, but during year 5, Ash got an elite set, resembling Lara Croft from Tomb Raider. At first I thought this was going to be a one-off thing, so I didn't mind it that much, and then we got Resident Evil crossover. Don't get me wrong, I love Resident Evil. I'd even say it currently is my favorite active gaming franchise, but come on, it hardly fits Rainbow Six style. Maybe if it was released during Operation Camera, then I wouldn't complain. And I don't even want to talk about Rick and Morty. Oh, there's Pickle Rick! The funniest shit you'll ever see! And even though I love Yakuza series, I don't think bringing John Yakuza, Sawama, or... <laughs> I love Goro Majuma, by the way. Was a good call. Those are two completely different games, genres, stories. It, it just feels out of place. Also, apparently there's an Associates Creed crossover. The rest of Year 6 felt bland. More map reworks, more ups that didn't bring enough to the table. Decent seasonal events, but at this point, this wasn't a siege me and my friends were playing back in 2017. Demise, it went from grounded in reality to hodgepodge of individuals with gadgets, some cooler than others. As for gameplay, I think the best way to describe it is that Ubisoft tries too hard to bring every operator to the same level so that they are picked equally and have a balanced win to last ratio. Furthermore, they try to balance how often attackers and defenders win, which is nigh impossible. I still don't think that allowing attackers to change operators during the prep phase was a good call. I almost forgot, I'm not sure whether this happened during this year, but the game was slowed down. Movement, aiming, leaning. In my opinion, it doesn't fit well with Siege's quick time to kill and one shot headshot. Getting ambushed is never fun, even more so when your character's slower reaction time makes it harder for you to survive it. And then we reach the end of year 6, with the cinematic showcasing multiple operators leaving Rainbow Six for Nighthaven, itself also separating from Rainbow. Like I've said before, over time Siege became more story oriented. One of the operators brought during year 6, Osa, is a member of Nighthaven, who felt like was brought only to push the Rainbow Six narrative forward, same as Flores. One of the ops of year 7, Grimm, feels similar in this regard, as he was tasked with hunting one of Rainbow Six operators down. For me, it feels like operators are not brought for the gameplay first, but for the narrative purpose. Op four, last op no way! <laughs> I got so distracted! Thankfully, Year 7 brought some hope. For instance, the committee is finally getting new maps. Three of them were introduced during Year 7, in fact. And they also added Stadium Bravo permanently, but I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, we lost two minutes because we had no idea how to get in. Oh my god, this map is... One of them is TDM exclusive and I only had one or two chances to play it, so... Let's just say it exists. 
As for the other two, I played them or plays only on TDM, so I won't comment on it on unranked or ranked games, but the layout seems okay. I had only one chance to play Night of Labs in an unranked game, which my team won 4 to nothing, so again, not enough experience on this one, but I kinda like it. And, apparently, Solar Raid brought a really good and unique operator in Solis. That's something at least. As of writing this, Siege is about to start year 8. The new attacker looks like a game changer, and Shield's rework are for now promising. No newbie though, this will end up being pushed into year 9. Maybe, just maybe, this will be the year where at least gameplay and content wise, Siege will improve. There's always a chance for it, right? Even if France rework is completely pointless, and having only one map rework and one new map for the entire year may not be enough to keep the game fresh. But for me, whether year 8 is successful or not, this will change nothing. Rainbow Six Siege in 2023 is not the same game I felt in love in 2017, and throughout this entire time I haven't even mentioned the cheater epidemic or how the game became even more toxic. When this became a big problem, I was already out. And from what I know, these two issues are still a big problem. They have clash. They actually have clash. The world is ended. They have clash. I, we forgot to banner. We forget, we forget to ban Clash. We are them, we are so them. We actually deserve to lose this game now. In retrospective, year 4 was the point the game started going downwards. Even still, at the very least, Siege was still fun until mid to late year 5. Around that time, Rainbow Six stopped being an alternative to CSGO, at least in my opinion. Instead, it became an alternative to Valorant. I'm even tempted to call it an alternative to Overwatch, but that's too far, even for me. Throughout making this video, I had some fun with Siege. There's still the tactical element, competitive aspect, clutching around is always thrilling, some changes were for the better, and there's always a bit of nostalgia, but I would lie if I said I wasn't frustrated at all. In fact, I even say I ended up getting frustrated, bamboozled or disappointed far more often. Like I said, it's not the game I fell in love in 2017, not anymore. From gameplay changes to themes, Ubisoft decisions, even community changed for the worse from what I've seen. Once every few seasons, I can see myself coming back to Siege for a week or two, if I end up being bored or there's something interesting to check out, but... I think I have to admit it, Siege has lost its charm, and it will probably never come back. To those who stuck with me until the very end, thank you. I apologize if I'm sometimes hard to understand, my accent is far from perfect and I'm aware of that, but I think I managed to convey well what happened to Siege throughout the years and what I think of it. Even if I didn't have as much fun with Siege as I hope I would, at least I found making this video entertaining, and I hope you found both good and entertaining to watch. I will probably make similar content in the future. I definitely want to do something on Yakuza when I finish 5 and 6. For now I'm saving like a dragon in both judgments for another day. And there are other games I'd like to cover in a similar manner, such as a certain Call of Duty, which I think I will cover next. I encourage you to share your opinions on Siege, both past and present, in the comments section. And if you found the video good, I'd appreciate it if you leave a like. Finally, if you want to see more of such a content, I encourage you to subscribe to be notified when I upload the next video. If you did any of this, I'm truly grateful. For now though, be seeing ya.